Active shooter prevention is more than a legal mandate. This is about virtuous leadership, recognizing a potential threat and preparing for it. Hoping that it won't happen to me is not enough. Hope is not a good strategy. It is clear from recent active shooter events that employers will need to provide some attenuating measures to protect their personnel from this form of workplace violence. The General Duty Clause, Section 5A1 of the Occupational Safety and Health Act, or OSHA, requires employers to provide their employees with a place of employment that is free from recognizable hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious harm to employees. Recent court rulings throughout the country have allowed negligence suits filed by victims of active shooters to proceed against employers for failing to provide defensive training to their employees. In other words, companies can no longer avoid their corporate responsibility to provide training on both how to spot potential active shooters and on how to react if so confronted. This is more than a simple calculus of risk reduction. It's about providing competent and effective protective training to persons in your charge. It is the essence of caring and virtuous leadership. The purpose of this video is not to alarm or frighten you, but rather to educate you on threat recognition and the appropriate steps to take if you find yourself in the vicinity of an active shooter. Hopefully after watching this video, you will be able to better identify potential active shooters and report them before violence erupts. At the end, you'll be given a short 10 question quiz that will help ensure that you learn the right lessons from this instructional video. Remember, you must act quickly, escape, hide, or attack if ever confronted by an active shooter. This training will help you act quickly and appropriately in the eventuality of an attack. bring you some details on a breaking story out of Aurora, Colorado this morning. A very scary situation, mm -hmm. a suburban Denver movie theater. Apparently there has been a mass shooting. What we're hearing from the police. A so mall outside of Portland, Oregon tonight. When as many as 60 shots rang out, the scene of holiday Americana turned into terrifying I mean, We've been telling you this morning there has been a shooting at a school in Newtown. This is the Sandy Hook Elementary School. Gunfire erupts in a normally quiet office complex. Sky local news reports down in New Orleans, according to local news reports, at least 12 people shot at a Mother's Day parade there. A gunman is dead after police say he opened fire at a McKinney Public Safety building. We do know that one suspect is confirmed dead. We had a tragedy that occurred here in our city, right in front of our public safety building, which obviously gets very close to home. None of our personnel on police or fire were injured during this incident. Very proud to say that. If you're in the middle of an active shooter, Countermeasure Consulting implores you to do three things. You want to react. You want to understand something is happening. You want to escape. You want to get out of the building at all costs, and you want to survive. You want to do that for you, your family, and for others. We cannot rely on the stupidity of our enemies because our enemies are resourceful, they're bright, and fight unfairly. The active shooter probably has plenty of ammunition. The active shooter has plenty of magazines. If we sit back and take the attitude of it'll never happen here, you've already lost. You've already become the sheep. On the national average, it takes law enforcement 14 minutes to arrive. Those 14 minutes are going to make a big difference between how many lives you're going to save versus how many are going to get lost. This video is set up to help you mitigate those 14 minutes of what to do before the law enforcement gets there. We don't teach police response strategies, we don't teach military response strategies, and we don't teach fighting strategies. We teach common sense approach to safety. The key is you have to take action.
One of the events that took place that I was involved in was at the McKinney Police Department. Someone woke up one morning and drove to the McKinney Police Department when his white Nissan pickup truck that was filled with ammonium nitrate. He proceeded to pop a flare in the front of the truck, popped the flare and threw it in the trailer, and then ran across the street and fired 168 rounds at the front of the police department. And about that time, we see glass breakage. So we realized we were under fire by an active shooter from the outside that had come to attack our police building. While he's doing this, he's waiting for an explosion to happen, thinking the ammonium nitrate would detonate. However, he got the formula incorrect. But his goal was to trump Oklahoma City. None of our personnel on police or fire were injured during this incident. Very proud to say that. An active shooter is an individual who is going in to cause a great deal of harm uh, to a group of people. The term shooter implies a firearm, but actually that's, that's not one of the key components. And they will almost always choose the most vulnerable populations to go after. They are not a new phenomenon. There's no geographic region that is excluded. Males account for approximately 75% of all offenders. 50% of attacks take place in under 12 minutes. 48% of incidents end by force, whether it's by police or citizens. I think trying to profile an active shooter is like trying to profile a drunk driver. There are lots of reasons why people drive drunk, and it's really not relevant if you're on the receiving end. I'm more focused on what they do because what they do has some consistencies. Why they do it has a variety of reasons, and unfortunately, we have seen that. Usually, they feel that someone has wronged them, and they are trying to make it right by violence of action. We have had people who've had some, some severe mental illness, or they have felt left out, and they've decided to make a name for themselves. And that's the only similarities that we can find so far. That's why I prefer to talk a little bit about what they do. We do know that some of the best predictors of behavior is what people say they're going to do. So if someone says that they are going to commit a violent act, I would take them at their word and I would call the police. Most people who have violent fantasies do not act on them. Now you start putting things together, they have fantasies, they start writing down those fantasies, then they start uh, collecting firearms and ammunition and come up with a plan of people they're going to kill. That's taking action. Only if a friend happens to pick up on it, someone that they trust, are you likely to have any idea that that's occurring. A long time ago, I was in Afghanistan, and it was when we had first gotten there, we didn't know much about it, and I was up and the second floor of a very rickety old hangar. And all of a sudden, the hangar started shaking. But I just assumed somebody was bringing in a large jet. And it wasn't until I gradually, slowly wandered back outside to see what was causing the noise that I recognized that we were in the middle of an earthquake. So I had done exactly the wrong things. I had interpreted it as a safe noise not to be worried about. The majority of people that I've interviewed after active shooters have all stopped and asked each other, is that a gunshot? Do I hear shots being fired? Did this just happen? What are we going to do? You hear loud noises all the time, not, oh my goodness, that might be someone actually trying to kill people. If you hear a gunshot, you don't want to stop and think, did I just hear a gunshot? Three words I'd like you to remember are react, escape, and survive. React to the threat escape from the threat so that you can survive. Must do something. We spend a lot of time in trouble training people to do fire drills to get out of a building. So if you think about that with all the emphasis that we give to fire drills and how deadly fires are, you see the challenge involved in getting people to recognize the threat with an active shooter. If you hear gunfire, if you see gunfire, you may have some risks in your brain that you are trying to process in slow motion. You need to retrain your paradigm. If I think I hear a gunshot, I'm going to get up and I'm going to leave. How do you train people to react in a way that's effective under high levels of stress? Some people, they just don't know what they don't know, unless you've been in these situations before. You just don't know how you're going to react. Even though in situations that are oftentimes openly perilous on their face, 
we're still surprised when something bad happened to us. You know, when times of stress, you're going to rise to the threat. Well, you know, studies show time and time again, you don't rise to the threat. You default to your level of training. So under stress, if you're going to default to your level of training, you better make sure you have the best training possible. If you remember nothing else, you must do something. People don't necessarily want to react. Let me not rush into this. Let me just see what's happening. This has never happened before. There's got to be something else going on. I break it down. What would I do or what would I want to know when faced with one of these problems? One is action versus reaction. The notion of action versus reaction that we must understand is that the bad guy always has the jump on us. I see something and then I respond to it understanding what it is. And those are called reaction intervals. And if you overlay that with the OODA loop, that if you are a threat to me, I have a certain number of reaction intervals I have to do. Bad guy has already set up an observed, oriented, and decided when to strike us. They're just waiting to act. And that acronym is called an OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, and act. You present threatening behavior towards me. I have to understand that there is threatening behavior coming towards me. That's one reaction interval. For the average trained individual to respond to a threat requires about a second and a half. That's an eternity in a firefight. It doesn't sound like much. But that's a big jump. How far can the average person run in about a second and a half? 21 feet, 25 feet. Preparation and practice. Be prepared. Practice what you are thinking. Know where your exits are. Know where your entrances are. Know the other employees around you. Report suspicious behavior immediately. Our decision that action versus reaction is often clouded by disbelief. Oh my gosh, is this really happening to me? There's no need to panic when you're faced with a situation. You know what is going on, you know how to control, and you can deal with. So that's the first lesson there. The more information you have, the more data you collect and your ability to process it, the better decisions you're going to make. Once you've realized that you need to take some action, you need to get out to escape. In 2011, I was on vacation with my family. We were driving on Cape Canaveral Avenue towards Cocoa Beach, and my 14-year-old daughter looked out the window and said, there's someone shooting in an office park. Sure enough, there was a gunman engaged in a firefight with police, and there was a ton of traffic ahead of us. Literally, people just, what I like to say, is stuck on stupid. They weren't in fight or flight mode. They were in stuck mode. We were in a rental car and we literally pushed our way out of the area, made a hard left turn into oncoming traffic, but we were moving away from the sound of the gunfire instead of moving to. At that time, in my mind, I was a father and a husband getting my family away from a gunman and not a policeman responding to the sound of bullets. But you've got to evacuate yourself out of the danger area. You've got to move and you've got to do that first. You have a family, you have friends, Wait and see is not an option, because the more time you give a shooter, the more damage they're going to do. The mission of an active shooter is killing and executing people for no reason at all, with no worries about their own self-preservation or life. It tells us that force is going to be required to stop this person. The odds of you having the force to do that are minimal. If you're sitting in an office, you are not prepared for that. You will be under a huge amount of stress when this occurs. So remember, run, hide, fight. 14 minutes is a very long time. Regardless of how far you move, by breaking out of that stasis of just sitting there going, I wonder what's going on, A, you're thinking in your head, that slows you down. You need to be moving and acting. In a corporate environment, there's a lot of closed in spaces and it's very hard to find an escape path. You should previously know where that escape path is after watching this training. If you know the exit is behind you and there's a shooter in front of you, you need to remain as low as possible while moving as fast as possible to that exit and escape. Open environments or open spaces, the retail areas, like the Kansas mall shooting. People were exposed to this active shooter that was walking through shooting people at random because they were stuck in just watching him. They weren't aware of their environment. They weren't aware of 
which direction to go to and they had no training and this is no fault of their own. No one ever taught them this information. If you're in these open area environments, such as a retail store, continue to move. You're less likely to be a target if you're moving because the shooter that's walking through any one of those areas I talked about is looking for the easy targets of opportunity. You need to be moving and acting and getting out of the danger area. That safety is behind cover. Cover means protection from firearms. So cover isn't the same thing as hiding. It means that a cartridge, a bullet, will not make it through that cover to injure you. During the incident, the McKinney Police Department, what he was trying to do was draw the police and the firefighters out so he could shoot them one at a time. What he didn't realize was the plume of smoke blinded him from the front of the department. Concealment. And when I use that word, it's a mask. Think of it as disguising yourself so you can't be seen. So a building or center block wall would be a good piece of cover. A glass window would not be cover. Once you're in a safe, covered area, begin to use your phone. Call 911. What about my friend that doesn't want to come? You're going to have to let your friend be. It's about self-preservation at that point in time. The kids heard an explosion, and they were reacting to what they thought was a fire. So they ran to another direction where another IED went off, and it sent the kids back. And what it did was it bottled them back into the library where they were trapped. Only thing students were trained for was to get under a desk and wait for help. These two children ran around and hunted the kids under the desk and executed them one by one. Stopping and doing nothing is similar to some footage that we have of Columbine High School shooting. We have students running one way only to find out that it was a trap because their goal was to end life that day and then end their own lives. So when we say hide is not your best option, it's because the people that are hiding are stationary targets. When you're dealing with this type of situation, you wanna develop the mindset of survival. If you can't run and get out of the office safely or out of the open area safely, you will not allow this person to cause you damage and fail to let you go home. The Department of Homeland Security says hide. And I don't disagree with that. But there are some real serious consequences that could occur from that. The shooter at Virginia Tech just went and hunted who he wanted to shoot at will. The largest amount of deaths in one single place was in one of the classrooms where a professor tried to lock them in a room and wouldn't let them leave. And this person found that room that didn't lock, opened the door, and shot the professor first and then the kids. That's why I prefer to talk about prepare to evacuate. So the entire time you're hiding, you're not hiding. You are planning, preparing to evacuate the danger area. You may temporarily have to keep out of the line of fire, but you're not gonna stay there. And you never think about yourself staying there. While you're hiding, be prepared to move. That is not a permanent stasis, uh, except under the most extraordinary circumstances. When you know a gunman is outside in the corridor, you want to secure the view, you want to hide out of sight from them, you want to silence your cell phone and get down behind your desk and just be as quiet as possible. It could take 45 minutes before the police are able to neutralize the threat. Hide behind a wall solid corridor that has a double lock cylinder behind a desk. Remember to black out the shades, silence your cell phone and try to remain there until it's safe to escape. The probability of that person surviving just increased. At all costs, should you not be able to do any of those things, don't become a victim and don't become a statistic. Homeland Security says fight, and I'd be a little more aggressive and I'd say attack. Gather a couple people and attack the shooter as violently and swiftly as possible to stop the threat. Now, is that a good idea? No, it's a horrible idea but it may be the best of some really bad alternatives that you have, realizing it needs to be as violent and as hard as you possibly can put forth. We call it, in the military, field expedient weapons. In the police department, we use our utility belt. If you are in an office building and you are behind a desk and a shooter comes in and you have no safe way out, hit them. 
and don't stop hitting them until you survive. If you have a chair, hit them with a chair. If you have a phone, smack them in the head with a phone. If you can dive over a cubicle on top of someone and take them to the ground, yell for help and ask for other people to help you incapacitate the shooter. Hit the gun out of their hand. Hit them in the face. Hit them anywhere that you think it might hurt them. But you want to incapacitate the shooter as quickly as possible. Attack with everything and every one that you have. The shooter will not stop until he inflicts as many casualties as possible. Make them the statistic. The law is on your side and your family's on your side. During an active shooting event, there is going to be a time that police arrive. Whether it's 14 minutes or under or 14 minutes or later, they are gonna show up. And when they do, there's some procedures that you need to follow. The first one you need to remember is you need to remain as calm as possible as you exit the building or as you're outside talking to the officers with as much information as possible because they are responding to the report of someone firing a gun and they don't know if that's you or someone else. Your body is going to physiologically respond um, as it should, which is in a life-threatening event. Your pulse will go through the roof, your pupils will dilate, you'll start to sweat. You've probably read that you may have involuntary bowel movements. You may want to freeze, which is why we spend so much time telling you you've got to move. But then once it's over, well, you all of a sudden have this huge response to being safe. Some of that may be talking. Some of that may just be wanting to go up and, and talk to the policeman, touch the policeman, likely to get you into serious trouble. Ever since the shooting at Columbine, the response tactics of police have transformed tremendously. Where they would used to show up, surround, create a perimeter, and call SWAT, now there's an, a less traditional approach. We had mass casualties, we had propane tanks that went off. The children, I mean, they're ingrained in our minds, the children walking across the field with their hands up. And now, of course, we've got the tragedy in Connecticut, the most recent one. Now the police show up. When the second or third police officer shows up on scene, they are entering your building. They're not there to repair the damage or fix the casualties. Even the people that are reaching out to them, please help me, please help me. They are there to stop the threat, which is the active shooter. It's hard words, but it's, it kind of drives the point home. Our job is to save lives. The ones that are injured, they're either gonna survive or they're gonna die. But why risk 50 more kids by stopping your, your advancement? In order to help these people, we've gotta stop the threat. We've gotta stop the threat or isolate it. They don't know who the shooter is, the odds are. They don't know what he looks like. They don't know what he's dressed like. All they know is that there's someone in there killing people. So as soon as there is any chance of you being observed by the police, you need to do a couple of things. One is, if at all possible, stay still. Second is make sure that your hands are able to be seen by the police. Policemen are highly attuned to looking to where the hands are and that they know that, that you are not one of the bad people. It may be possible that the police still don't know that for sure, so they might actually handcuff you. Be prepared to deal with that and do not fight it. Be ready to corral yourself and your neighbors and your office mates in a safe area away from the active shooter if it's not resolved yet. And try to keep it as calm as possible even though it's an incredibly violent account. The calmer you are, the better your chances are of surviving the incident. The most important thing is do not go back until it's told all clear and safe to do so. They're not there to treat wounded. They're not there to evacuate you. They're there to find that shooter and stop that shooter as soon as possible before he can kill anybody else. There'll be a medical team that'll be on their way. There'll be people to evacuate you out of there right behind them, but that's not their job. Preparation, practice. I'll tell you that being involved in other active shooting events, the two as a police officer dictated a very specific response. The one as a civilian probably woke me up because I knew that when my daughter said, Dad, someone's shooting, I actually closed my eyes after we got through it and said, what would my wife do at work? What would you do at work? The less you have to think about, the better. An office is not a place of a threat. 
Why would you ever think that an office is gonna, going to have a threat, going to have some risk in, involved with it? If we sit back and take the attitude of it'll never happen here, you've already lost. You've already become the sheep. It's that cognitive shift between a safe environment to recognizing that there is a danger. The active shooter is prepared. The active shooter probably has plenty of ammunition. The active shooter has plenty of magazines. We cannot rely on the stupidity of our enemies. The more information you have and your ability to process it, the better decisions you're going to make. You must do something. You want to react. React to the threat. You want to understand something is happening. Wait and see is not an option. Because the more time you give a shooter, the more damage they're going to do. If I think I hear a gunshot, I'm going to get up and I'm going to leave. You want to escape. Escape from the threat. You want to get out of the building at all costs. Force is required to stop this person. The odds of you having the force to do that are minimal. So remember, react, escape, survive. And you want to survive. So that you can survive. If you want to do that for you, your family, and for others. If you remember nothing else, you must do something. There is going to be a time that police arrive. And when they do, you need to remain as calm as possible as you exit the building. They are responding to a report of someone firing a gun. And they don't know if that's you or someone else. In summary, you want to be ready for an active shooter at all costs. You don't want to be a victim. You want to have a survival mindset. You want to know what actions you're going to take. You want to be aware of your surroundings. We can never be too prepared to respond to the threat of perpetrators going to come into our schools and do some harm to our children or our staff. If you've watched this video, you should know where the exits are. You should have a predetermined escape path. But the key focal point is do not stop moving until you are safe. Once you're safe, you have survived the event. The rest can be dealt with later.